So I guess it's time to, to start the class. Uh, so um, welcome to the class, Introduction to Embedded Systems. I am Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli, clearly from Sweden. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and I'm co-teaching this class with uh, Edward Lee, who is also a co-author of the book that we are going to use for the class. Uh, now, before we start, I wanted to alert you that, I mean, many of you were, many, some of you were waitlisted. So we decided to, to take you all. So all the people in waitlist will make it, um, except for people who are not regular students of the university. So extension people, we cannot accommodate. Already like this, we are way oversubscribed, especially for the lab. Uh, now, uh, second thing is that graduate students should be enrolled in the graduate numbering and the undergraduate students should be in the undergraduate numbering. So some of you kind of went this way, so no good. So you have to uh, re-register according to your uh, um, status. Um, other thing is that everyone who is taking the class has to be enrolled in a lab session. Uh, now, since we didn't have enough lab uh, sessions to accommodate all of you, we added a new one. So there is going to be a new um, uh, session that you can take. But all of you have to be enrolled in the lab. Uh, now, um, the people in scheduling are arranging uh, this situation. So right now you probably will still find uh, the limitation on the lab, so you cannot enroll and all that. But uh, by tomorrow, everything should be done. So. Uh, since the first lab is on Tuesday, um, then you got to have all of this done over the weekend. Okay, from tomorrow to the uh, to Monday, you have to have this thing resolved. Uh, so these are the uh, initial kind of uh, uh, ads. Um, and uh, now, um, how I structure the uh, first class is to give you first some motivation about what this class is all about and why it is important. And then we'll go into some of the administrative stuff, which is much less fun, so I'll kept it at the very end. Right? So um, now let's go uh, to uh, the point. So what is the main subject of the class is embedded system, but actually uh, since the class was uh, started, there is another wave of uh, uh, topics that have been very much interesting to people. It's called cyber physical systems, right? So the name sounds very appealing. It's more or less, and we see in how different they are, but it's more or less uh, um, sitting on the same principle. So uh, I would like to give you some uh, uh, view of what this uh, uh, embedded cyber physical system are all about. So what you see here is a combination of things that are actually can be considered, all of them, uh, embedded system or cyber physical system. So first of all, what is a cyber physical system? It's a combination of a, a, a logic, so for example, a computer program that runs on a microprocessor and the physical world. So it's a combination of the two. And that's the reason why they are called cyber physical. It's a combination of these two different words. Now, how different is this from standard computing system? Is obvious because the standard computing system the aspect of the physical world is not there. Okay? So in fact, the basic abstraction of computer science is that time doesn't matter, power doesn't matter, matters only the sequences of operation that you are taking. Okay? And so that is, to deal with this system, is the wrong abstraction. So we will discuss this and we'll show you how you can approach the design of this system in such a way that you do take care of physical variables in the uh, system itself. Now, um, there is not a single thing today that is not uh, uh, related to embedded systems. So there is always a, a microprocessor someplace, and there is always some logic someplace in almost any physical system that you deal with today. Cars, airplanes, uh, manufacturing lines, as you see there, defense systems, avionics, so airplanes, is all based on uh, electronic intelligence that is placed inside these uh, systems. Now, you also have seen, especially in the automotive domain, that there have been tons of recalls, right? So the system doesn't quite work as the people who designed hoped it to work. 
And so you have to recall it to fix it. Now, uh, we all know about the mega problems General Motors had about the famous ignition switch, right? And there were also a few deaths around, and that, that was a major disaster, not only for the loss of lives, but also for the company, for General Motors, who lost billions in the process. So uh, the more complex you have a system, the more stuff you put into a system, the more likely is that something is wrong. Or there are some unexpected interactions between different parts of the system so that you um, end up with a situation that you wouldn't like to be in. Okay? So these systems are becoming more and more pervasive, but they are more and more difficult to design. And there is no end in sight. So it's going to be more and more and more and more until we will reach a, a situation where we can possibly design this system any longer. Okay. So now, um, this one is, uh, is an example that uh, you can find in the book. And is a small flying object. It's quad rotor, right? It's a sort of helicopter with four engines, right? And why four engines? Because it can make it do all kinds of, uh, of weird stuff, okay? So... Um, the, um, the kind of thing that you need to do to make this fly is quite amazing, right? So this is a, an independent, there is no man that drives, so these guys go alone, so there is an intelligence in there that is performing a task. In this particular case, the task could be to follow someone <laughs> on the ground or to um, uh, take some load someplace. And the interesting thing is that it is indeed unhooked to human beings. Uh, and so you have to make sure that this thing doesn't crash, doesn't crash on your head, or doesn't kill someone, hopefully, and at the same time does what it's supposed to do. So um, you have then to do modeling of this system to control it, right? Because, of course, if you don't put a controller in it, it will go an anywhere and will do all kind of bad stuff. So you need to model the flight dynamics, so what is the dynamic of the way in which this guy flies. And this is chapter two of your books. Uh, you have to look at the modes of operation. Am I landing? Am I taking off? Am I cruising along? Right? These modes, right? Modes of operation of the system. Then how you transition between a mode and another. How you compose behavior of the subsystems that are interacting in this uh, 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 system. And then also, and we will see uh, some interesting movies about it. You may have a fleet of these guys that are talking to each other. So how do you handle the communication between all these different guys? And why do you want them to communicate? And that is in chapter six. Now, when you go down to the actual design of the electronic part of this, uh, of this system, you got to worry about sensor and actuators because sensor and actuators are the interfaces of the cyber system with the physical world. So sensor and actuators are the hands, actuators, the hands, the foot, and so on. And the sensor are your senses, right? So that is what the a cyber physical system does. In some sense, it's similar to what we do. So processors are, of course, the intelligence. Memory system is the way in which you store information, of course. Uh, then the way in which you interface a variety of different sensors that have to co collaborate to give you an overall picture of what the context is. Uh, then you want to be able to write concurrent software. So software that is running possibly on different quadro rotors, but it has to interact somehow. So writing concurrent software is one of the most difficult tasks you can think of. Right? It's very, very complicated. And then real-time scheduling. So you have to react to possible situation in real time, really fast. So what does it mean real time? There is not such a thing as real time, right? So there is always an approximation to real time. What, what we intend as real time is something that you cannot detect that there is a delay in it, okay? So that's what is called real time. Um, all right, then you have to, of course, before you put this in flight, uh, you want to debug it. Now, you can't possibly debug it while the guy is flying because he may kill someone. Okay, so that's not a good idea. So what you have to do is you have to go through a um, virtual uh, debugging. And so it's called analysis, right? Analysis, you analyze the model of a system 
to uh, verify that the system does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't kill people around. Maybe you are designing to kill someone, and that's a different issue, but we will not deal with it. Uh, and you want to achieve safe behavior, verifying the safe behavior and guaranteeing timeliness, so meaning that all the controls have to arrive in time and that you have the right context and you're not doing something stupid. Okay. So now, what is the actual platform, computing platform, uh, upon which this system uh, relies? Okay? So uh, it is, uh, you can see there the yellow boxes. There are free microprocessor free. Right? So there are free computing stuff uh, that um, are going on in parallel. There are two PC-104 and Stargate are standard computing engines, if you like. Not so Robostix. Robostix is a particular low-level microprocessor that deals with the low-level control of the quadro rotor, which is essentially making sure that uh, the uh, engine does what it's supposed to do. All the rest is the thinking and the decision making that goes on when the thing flies. Now you see on the right is Wi-Fi and that is a connection to the outside world where you send information. So you send information to your friends that are flying with you or to the ground to the people down that can shoot the guy if it goes bananas you take it down. Right? Yeah. Uh, now the robotics that you see here in fact as uh, uh, some interesting tasks that you see here. And this IMU, Ranger, and Ranger. So what do they do? They essentially assess where the quadro rotor is, is locationing, is uh, to decide where you are. Now, it looks like, so what is the big deal? It is difficult. It is very difficult. So today, in fact, uh, precise localization is still an open question to do it quickly, nicely, Precisely and cheaply. Okay, so that, uh, that this part here is uh, that one. Notice that uh, to find out where you are, if you are flying, is not only a two-dimensional problem, like if you are walking or running or whatever, but it's a three-dimensional problem, right? So you you got to have uh, one more information. Now, the planes, uh, you know, the big planes, the seven eight seven, whatever, uh, are flying based on two systems. One is GPS. Right? Global positioning system. But then there is another one, which is called the inertial system, that, is, that was the one that people used before GPS was available, and they had only that one. Now, the problem with the INS is that it can be, uh, it can be very precise locally, but it drifts. So you may think that you are on top of San Francisco, you're actually in Los Angeles. Right? Very precisely, right, in terms of uh, location and X and Y, coordinate, but it drifts, right? And so GPS instead, of course, cannot drift. You know, satellites are there. So uh, the combination of the two is uh, the best way to do this. Now, this is another important aspect of designing embedded system is sensor fusion. So you're taking two different sensors, right, INS and GPS, and you fuse them. You use both information to do what you need to do. Okay. Um, and then you have a stereo cam, which is actually a video system, so that the quadro rotor can see if something comes on its way, a bird, for example, and it's trying to avoid it. So how do you see a bird, right? So you have to have some kind of camera. You can use a visual system, or you can use an infrared system, which is more or less the same thing. So you have to see what is around you, and that upper part is it. Now. It looks like a stupid little thing, and look how much complexity it is to master and to make this thing do what you want. All right, so what is this course all about? It's about designing these things, it's about making things fly, not really. There will be a part of it in which we will show as examples how you do these things, but the main point of the class, and in general in a school uh, that has some pretense of being a good school is about foundation. So what you want to do is that you want to learn from the class what is important. Okay? So that in the future, you know, technology changes all the time, right? I said before that GPS was not there, right? When you were flying only INS. But you had other ways of doing sensor fusion. So if I taught you how to do sensor fusion in the abstract sense, once you have a GPS, you have to put with INS, certainly 
There are two different systems what you did before, but the principles are the same. You have to make two different sets of sensors talk to each other, right? So the whole point of this class is to teach you about abstractions, composition rules, modeling, this kind of stuff. So if tomorrow you are going to have a super duper incredible neural network based whatever processor, the principles are still the same. So you can still work on this thing. Now, in fact, there are two ways in which you can go about this very complex system. One is hacking, right? So you go and start doing, right? And then hope for the best. Cross your finger and say, eee. Now, you, uh, uh, and then if it doesn't work, say, damn, right? But uh, <laughs> that's not scientific, right? Now, interestingly enough, 99% of the embedded system of the past were exactly designed like that, OK? And I say, let's go and do it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, go, 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 go. Boom. OK, here we go. <laughs> now, this is OK when you have a very simple system, because come on, come on, say, boom. OK, I understand why it did boom, right? So you fix it, and the thing works. Now, because of the complexity you have today, this method doesn't work. Even if it does boom, to figure out why it did boom is extremely difficult. So that's not a good idea. So the focus, then, is on models. Is mathematical abstractions of the system that you do so that you can analyze it before you put it in practice. Okay, so now, what is the difference? And uh, the, the, your book um, is organized along three different axes, if you like, uh, parallel to each other. It's about modeling, design, and analysis. So modeling is indeed is a process of understanding how your system does, so writing equations. Let's put it in this way. And what do you do uh, with modeling is describing what your system does or what it's supposed to do, right? So one is descriptive, what it does, or what it should do is prescriptive, okay? So both models are important. So one is the guy who's designing and say, I want my system to do this, this, and that, and writes a question about it. Now, you have a real system, and what you want to do is you want to describe this real system and then see what it does, right? So two different processes, right? They still use model, but it's two different points of view. One I'm looking this way, the other I'm looking that way, okay? And so any engineering design is about meeting in the middle. It's between the top down and the bottom up. Now, the design is a structural creation of artifacts and specify how your system is supposed to do what it does, right? So it, it um, implements your ideas. The analysis is a process of understanding better what the system does and why it does what it does, right? So that if it does boom in simulation, you can then backtrack and say, aha, this is where I went wrong, right? Same thing as when you debug a computer program. Now, this is much more complicated uh, than a computer program. It's already debugging a computer program is not easy, okay? So that's just to give you an idea of what. So in this class, we are going to address all three topics. right? And, but in the design part, especially, and uh, you will see, we will start actually with that so that you can start your lab, is more about the hardware aspect and the implementation aspect than higher level of design uh, that nevertheless we have to face. OK. So now. Uh, let's look at why is, are these things relevant. Well, we already say they are everywhere, right? So they are in cars and airplanes and this and that. So it seems natural that these are important things. But if you look at uh, who makes money today in, in the web, right, in the web, in the world, is about cell phones, web, that kind of stuff. So what are the largest companies that we find, both in terms of uh, uh, market evaluations and in terms of revenues are people like Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, especially, number one, Apple, right? And do they do any of this cyber physical system in their products where they make one gazillion dollars? Actually, no. And then you say, so are you selling smoke here in this class? You know, this is real stuff, right? And this crap that you are talking about may be interesting, but it doesn't hack it. If I want to become gazillionaire, that's not what I should invest. Well, guess what? Okay, so McKinsey, holy! <laughs> so McKinsey, big consulting companies, is supposed to be the think tank of, 
uh, the companies and the way in which strategy is laid out. So the, every year they put out a uh, report about what is the most disruptive technology around. So they put out this analysis, and you have, uh, what, uh, 12 uh, topics of great importance. Now, these 10 topics, there are at least four which are related to this class. And one is the Internet of Things, which is probably the most related one. So here, my friend Christopher Brooks, who is uh, actually the guy who's uh, behind most of the kind of things that we do in the labs and uh, in programming and all of that. So he's the guru <laughs> of, of these things. Well, he says, well, look, you know, the Garner, which is a marketing company, uh, every year puts out the hype factor, right? So the things that are highest in the interest of people, but they are, you know, bogus, right, kind of. Uh, they, they, there is an overinflated expectation. Well, guess what? Internet of Things is at the top of the hype curve, right? Well, do we believe that? Well, you know, I like, I still like it, right? Maybe hype, but maybe not. And let's see uh, and, and what people do about it. That cloud technology, everybody knows about it. Advanced robotics is a big, 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 big issue. Now, robotics is, is the task of designing a mechanical object that is a lot of intelligence, right? It does very complex tasks. And it's supposed to coordinate with uh, humans and with other objects. So that is a typical uh, system as we study in this class. And then, last but not least, is autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles. So cars that drive by themselves. Now, if 10 years ago you went around and said, okay, we are going to have cars that drive by themselves, then people would take you for crazy and just bring you to the hospital, right? Now, well, not so any longer. So autonomous and uh, uh, near autonomous vehicles are actually the most important thing that car companies are investing on. And they're investing one gazillion dollars. So if you want to be gazillionaire, if you had a way of doing autonomous driving vehicles, that don't crash into people in other cars in walls, you will be gazillionaire, okay? So that is a big issue, all right? But do you think that is simple? Of course not, right? Can you imagine how many things we have to worry about when you drive? But for certain, one thing is clear. If you indeed have a way of creating an uh, uh, autonomous driving car, you are not going to have nearly as many accidents as you have today, 99% of the accident you have today is due to the human factor. Because you, uh, you know, I saw that myself. I was driving down to the Silicon Valley and was a lady with her foot on the steering wheel painting her nails while driving, right? I mean, gee, I say, I want to be away from this car, right? Uh, yeah, but it's not the only way. Other people did even crazier things, right? So, Bad, right? So people drink, you know, that's not so very good. People talk on the cell phone. So, you know, Apple and company have to do something, right? And because they are killing people by, by inventing these objects, okay? All right, so this is important stuff. So economic potential. Now, again, hype factor, whatever, but the uh, potential is like for Internet of Things, 36 trillion dollars, right? It's, it's almost like the budget of the United States. Cloud technology, 1.7 trillion to 3 trillion. Interestingly enough, cloud, everybody talks about cloud, you know, greatest thing since the bottle of beer, but the Internet of Things is 20 times as big, right? So, as potential. Advanced robotics, 6 trillion. Already advanced robotics is more than the cloud. So, the point is that, again, if you want to become zillionaire, that is the field, right? Is the field is interaction between the physical world and the computing world. All right, autonomous, near autonomous vehicle uh, for trillions, so tons of money. Okay, now, do people, I mean, like Google, uh, are so stupid, let's say, who cares, right? Like in the old times, some of the companies would disappear, say it about new technology, say, who cares, right? Uh, and there were some people who said, I can't see what a computer can be used for. We're talking about 1940s. Okay, so don't, don't panic. Uh, no, nobody would say the same today. But Google um, has done a few things, right? First of all, the first real autonomous driving car that has been put in the street is a Google car, right? So 
So you, you saw it probably running around in uh, around Palo Alto. And it really, you know, drives by itself. And it had only one failure, with nothing to do with intelligence, this and that, and so on. So it was just a mechanical failure. So it is possible to do that. Now, unfortunately, it's slightly expensive. So in order to have a car that refuses to crash, you have to give it a lot of senses, right? And you want to do it even better than a human. So can you see through walls? I can't. Maybe some of you superhuman gazillionaire can see through walls. But I can't. Can a car see through walls? The answer is yes. How? With a radar. Okay? So the, indeed, the eyes of the autonomous driving cars are radars. And so you can even see behind the corners. Right? And so that's the reason why you are preventing a lot of accidents from happening. Unfortunately, it costs 70,000 damn dollars. Right? Just the uh, radars. Right? So slightly too expensive. Right? But as we all know, if you have a way of doing things, and you put a lot of engineers like us on the problem, and then from $70,000, it will end up costing seven cents. And then we are talking, right, because seven cents everybody can afford. Okay. Uh, and the range finder is mounted on the top is a Velodyne 64 beam laser, right? It's like Star Wars. Now, there is also another use for the laser if I were driving, since I come from Sweden. You know, and if you ever drive in Rome, right, you want to have lasers all over the place because you want to zap people around you to try not to have accidents. Okay, so now, uh, so they invested in making this car, right? Now, everybody, and I worked for many long years for General Motors and uh, BMW, Mercedes, so I am very familiar with the automotive domains. Guess what? They were scared to death. Oh my God, Google is becoming a car maker. Could be, but I don't think so. And so the reason why they wanted to do this is because they want to own the infrastructure, right? To make the vehicle a reality. So they say, look, it can be done. And by the way, you need all this infrastructure from Google to make it go, right? So, right, right. so they sell more uh, of their stuff. Fine. But they close a 3.2 billion purchase of Nest. Now, what is Nest? Does anyone know what uh, Nest does? Okay. It's a thermostat. A thermostat. Now, thermostats, <laughs> Google. Okay. Why? Do they want to know if their computer overheats? Right? <laughs> they always do, right? <laughs> no, of course. But that's not probably the reason why, right? Why do they want to do that? Any, any guess? Well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to over, you know, uh, interpret what we do. Yes. So, uh, I used to work at that. That's okay. Uh, okay. And so bingo, 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 bingo. So my, my guess was right. So they want to own the, the how. So the car, autonomous driving car, they want to know, own transportation. Next, they want to own the house. Now, do they want to, to you know, to, to sell one gazillion uh, uh, thermostats? Mm, not in the car. So what they want to do is they, they want to use the thermostat as a door into the framework, right? And so, in fact, they publish, you know, the new standard communication for the home and blah, blah. That is the game, all right? Now, not over yet. Remember the, the famous sectors? There is also the sectors of robotics, right? So what did they do? They went off and bought global, uh, Boston Dynamics, right? Boston Dynamics is the most exciting robotics company I've seen. I mean, if you look at some of YouTube, you see this monster and it's walking down like this and I say, oh my God, and Frankenstein is coming. And it slides down in, in the snow and on the ice, on the lake. <sighs> you know, if they, if, and it is for military application, and you say, well, how come? Google wants to become a military company, not at all. So what do you want to do with advanced robotics? Well, you want to own the manufacturing plants. So now you have the home, the manufacturing plants, the transportation system, what is left, right? So that is the, you know, strategy. And that is the reason why these guys are entering into that. But it's not over yet. What did they buy? <laughs> Another company, you know, drones. You know, they bought a drone company. And Facebook also, you know. They bought flying machines, like the quadrotor we were talking about, 
flying machines, unmanned flying machines. I said, what the heck do you do with an unmanned, you know, besides going in Afghanistan and doing crazy stuff, right? Which this guy, some of these guys did, right? But uh, Google, I don't think they are in that domain. Also because Eric Schmidt was a student here. I know him very well. And he's not exactly to the right. So he's rather on the left. So he's not in the cards, OK? So uh, well, they want to do that for two reasons. One is um, the declare reason, which is the same as Facebook, is that if you use drones, you bring internet to everybody. OK. Now, the other reason is uh, because you can monitor what is going on uh, in a particular region. So for example, suppose that you know, we had the big earthquake in Napa. Suppose it's bigger than what was there. And then all the communication are broken, right? So, so you have these drones flying over, and they connect everybody together. And you can find out what went wrong and if people are stuck in places. So it is that. Now, in addition, I can use these drones to do what? Maps. Now, maps is a big business, right? And everybody says, well, what is so difficult about maps? Talk to Apple, right? <laughs> OK, next. Apple, you know, what does Apple want to do? You know, all, Google is very clear, very intelligent. They are going everywhere. Well, guess what? Apple is talking to Tesla. And I have reason to believe that they are interested in purchasing Tesla, in buying Tesla. Oops, they are becoming a car company, right? <laughs> and why Tesla? Because what does Tesla use? Batteries, right? And what was one of the 12 uh, disruptive technology? Batteries, right? And batteries are really important. Everywhere you do, everything you do, batteries are it. So Tesla and Apple are very interested in making batteries. And in fact, they have a joint manufacturing plant. There are all kinds of plants to do that. One gazillion dollar invested in making batteries. But if you look at the way in which Tesla is perceived, is the same in the world of cars. It's very similar to what Apple is perceiving in the world of computing. High class, expensive, nice properties. Everybody wants to have one. I'm not so sure, because if you really buy a Tesla, you don't know how to drive it. You kill yourself, like a Ferrari, actually even worse, because it doesn't make noise. And so if you have a Tesla behind you, you don't realize you have. So you go like this, and boom, you know. You're... <laughs> OK, so the future of CPS. So this is the present. So even big companies are investing in this interaction between the physical and the cyber. So there is not going to be any single company who's not going to be interested in this. So you are in the right class. And in fact, we are way oversubscribed. So you must have uh, read some, uh, some articles someplace. Yeah. OK, now, what is going to happen? So the emerging IT scene. So this one is something that we have been uh, talking about for many years. In particular, Professor Ian Rabai is the author of this uh, slide, which is very nice. That's when I started. When I started, you know, I, I must say that I graduated in 1971. Now, in 1971, there was no terminal, OK? We were programming the computer with cards, right? So the card readers, right? You take these cards, which are not the credit card reader. When we were reading these cards, were holes. And the holes were zeros and ones, right? So OK, that's where I come from. So we had these big computers that were less than one MIP and were occupying three times as much as this space, OK? That's 1971. So fast forward, where are we today? Today we are on the cell phones, right? That, that's the access, the mobile access, cell phones and laptops, right, in the IT world. What is in the future? So this we already say is a sort of uh, deja vu. It's uh, where all the action happens today, but in a few years, no action at all. So it's a very mature kind of technology, even though you think it's still very cool and there are some very interesting projects uh, going on. And you have Samsung and you have Apple. They're going at each other and like with vengeance. We'll see. But the future is about what we call the sensor is warm. And the sensor is warm is one gazillion different sensors that are going to um, interact, and they are going. Uh, and now, okay. Other question to the class: What is this guy? About sensors. Any idea? What? Is a? No. Well, yes. 
that yes is a, a is an interface to neurons so it's an ECG but you, you these needles go inside the neurons so you have to to take the guy and <laughs> this thing in in the brain right? actually it happens this way so it is possible to do that so that is uh, called brain machine interface so you're going to get a, a guest class as a bonus I just uh, I just um, called my, one of my friends here at Berkeley who does this kind of thing, so he's going to give you a class about how to do these things. And, and then someone of you will volunteer and will do a, <laughs> a test of it. <laughs> okay, so of course the center of the world is not going to be any more of the big mainframes and the like, it's going to be the cloud, which is a virtual concept to say is all the intelligence that we can put together by one gazillion computers connected together. So. The world is going to be changing. I mean, most of the people are not going to use this stuff anymore, right? Forget about the cell phones. Who gives a damn? So what happens is that you are going to be immersed into um, the electronic world, if you like, right? So assume that all these walls are going to be covered, plastered with uh, um, sensor. Sensor can be temperature. By, by the way, uh, as you can see, the temperature is raising, probably because your brains are working very hard, and we consume energy, and the energy you know, comes out. And so they will sense that, and they will always keep the temperature constant in the nest of the future, right? The thermostat of the future. But it's also going, for example, I don't need this anymore. I can do like this, and the new slide comes up. And I can even put together different slides by moving my hands. You know, just standard stuff that you see in movies, science uh, fiction, and all of that. Uh, but it is going to be possible. Now, if you want to see the future, just look at Star Trek. There is one thing that I would love to be possible. I don't think it will be ever possible, but it's teletransport. Beam me up, Scott. That is one gazillion there for you right there. Okay. So now, what do you do if this uh, sensor is warm? Well, the sensor is warm, and you can instrument almost anything, and the key point is that you can gather, synthesize, and apply information, right? That will change completely the way in which we do things. And already, IBM, for example, has um, um, gotten big uh, contracts with governments, like, for example, the government of Brazil, to manage towns, entire towns, so everything, so from... You know, the dispatching, the police, uh, getting, you know, there are, uh, if you go to uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi, you see that every single post has a camera in there. So what do you do with all this data? You continue to collect it, big data, cloud technology, uh, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. So to try to figure out what it is that you are trying to, to understand, right? So... Uh, I would not try to steal anything anymore in the future, okay? So if you have any idea about that, well, probably you can't do that anymore. So it's going to be a thing of the past because everything we do is going to be monitored, right? There's no question about it. Already today, uh, anybody can know where you are by following your cell phone, right? Easy. And so when people talk about privacy, then you always have to ask them, are you using your cell phone? Sure. Are you worried about privacy? Oh, yes. Don't use your cell phone. Right. <laughs> anyway, so how many people will say, oh, no, cell phone is mine. Okay, uh, okay I see a guy. Why are you here? <laughs> this is the wrong class. <laughs> anyway, so because this is uh, privacy with a big bar on top of it, uh, you know, a compliment to privacy. Okay. Now, this is a biocyber system, so linking the cyber and biological worlds is another thing that is possible. And so it's already been done that you can, monkeys, for the time being, monkeys. So you have a monkey sitting in Rice University, is controlling an arm, which is at MIT, okay, with his brain, right? No, no typing, no nothing, just thinking about what he wants to do. Okay, so this is the famous, you know, that sensor that I was talking about implanted in the brain of a poor guy. Uh, this is the architecture of the electronic system that is implanted in there. And, you know, the most, what is the most difficult part here? Is to nail the thing on, on the brain. Easy. So what is difficult? He has already taken the class. It's not worth it. So. <laughs> That's exactly it. What is the most difficult thing is to interpret what goes on in your brain. So you have to establish a map 
between your brain wave and what you want, right? So in fact, the training is about that stuff, right? So you train the system. And, and not necessarily you, you have to think about, I want, you know, that coffee, right? So I want the coffee, and then in the future he says, I want the coffee. The robot will come here and say, sir, here is your coffee. <laughs> Uh, but the point is that in order to have the coffee, he may have to think red. And if he wants cappuccino, he has to think blue, because red and blue are easier to detect than coffee or cappuccino. Okay, so, uh, and that is the most difficult part, right? Okay, now, uh, we say that we have an emphasis on modeling, because it's very difficult to test this stuff in reality, so you want to do an a, a abstract representation of the system. So now, this one is a physical system, is a robot. This is actually a real robot that is used to manufacture cars. And now you have an embedded system, which is a computational part, so the boards that control the operation of the, of the robot. And uh, they are networked together, and these boards are uh, placed in various parts of the robot. And then the sensors are telling you what the position of the drilling tip or other machinery that the robot is actuating. And these guys do computation, and then they give an actuation command, like, for example, drill here, boom, and they drill. Okay. Now, um, in order to make this thing go, is that we have to marry the physical. The physical is that this guy moves, right? So its operation, um, if you want to describe how it moves, you have to use differential equations, right? Because it's a continuous system, and a continuous system is best described with differential equations. Okay, it's not the only way, but I don't want to go into statistical modeling and that kind of stuff. You can even model it at the level of the atoms, not in the cards, right? It's, it will be very stupid. Which tells you also that modeling is something that you have to think about to decide what is the level of accuracy you want. So if you want to determine what is the movement of these things, atoms don't matter. They really matter, but they are inside, so you don't care. You look at the envelope of the of all the uh, material that is in there. So, equation-based model. And so the abstraction is a physical modeling process. So is the bottom-up part. So you got the physical system. You represent it by eliminating unnecessary details because the goal is to have a, a something that is easy to play with, with respect to the original system, and yet has all the information that you want to assess. So modeling is a really serious issue. And so people who know how to do modeling, they are very much sought after. They're not gazillionaires, not in the least, but let's say a few 20,000, I mean 100,000, 200,000 all the time, okay, for doing this. Okay. Now, on the other side, you got this stupid printed circuit board with a microprocessor on it and software that runs on it, right? So do you want to use par a partial differential equation? For what? to describe what the computer does. You could, right? Because after all, the, there are electrons that move and all that, but why? Right? It's way too detailed. So um, the issue is that we said before that programming doesn't have the concept of time. And so you have models of computation, so way in which the computer executes. Now you got a differential equation on one side, and you got this abstract behavior of computer programs. Now, how do you marry the two, right? How do you make sure that the composition of the two does something useful? And uh, here we go with the models versus so reality. So this one is uh, Solomon Gollum. So that's a pretty, how to say, um, uh, unsettling guy. So if you look at uh, Criminal Minds, probably it will be a good character for Criminal Minds. But uh, it, it nevertheless was a mathematician, as often mathematicians are, a kind of, uh, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen? So anyway, so um, he was um, <clears throat> uh, interested, of course, in modeling uh, processes. And one of the things that he did is he essentially invented Tetris, right? But with mathematical concept about it. Um, and it, it was the first one to talk about the, um, the issue of abstraction. So in fact, you will never strike oil by drilling through the map. So what does that mean? So a model is a map, if you like of the physical system. It's like the map of the streets, right? It's Google Maps, right? Okay. Now, when you don't drive on the Google Maps, right? You drive in the streets. But the Google Map is used to make you go in the right direction. So 
So that's what models are all about. It's making you go in the right direction. But you don't actually use it to go, right? You use it to decide where to go. Same thing as what he was talking about. So you cannot get oil by drilling from a map. So, but this does not, of course, diminish the value of a map because it's a guiding principle. It's something that tells you what you should be doing. Now, this Herman Coppets is a good friend, both of Edward Lee and myself. And, uh, and then he was uh, philosophizing about the fact that people say this system has the following property. And what they mean is that the model of that system has this property. Because the system itself is very difficult to analyze to say this has the property. But what you can analyze is the model. So the model has the property. So the name of the game then is to say, if I say that the model has this property, can I infer that the real system has the same property? And this is called fidelity, right? So the model has fidelity with respect to the uh, system. Doesn't have to be accurate to be uh, to have fidelity, right? Fidelity is tracking, if you like. Doesn't have to do exactly the same thing, but if you ask the question, you should have the same answer. Okay. Now, um, there is a, another interesting uh, thing that is related for uh, those of you who are in electrical engineering and uh, have studied designing circuits, and it's about synchronous modeling, right? Synchronous uh, architectures, right? So uh, when did we uh, start using synchronous architecture? Uh, the idea of synchronous is essentially you have latches and you have computation that is carried through a set of transistors that are combinational logic. And so the dynamic behavior of the computer, for example, of the brain of the computer, of the CPU, is through these sequences of operation. That you have a latch, you read the latch, you compute, you store the value in the latch, the next logic reads that value, it keeps on going this way. Now, what did that do? Well, actually, that methodology was used only for one thing, is to get rid of asynchronous behavior of physics. Because physics is all asynchronous, right? So if you think about transistors, they are asynchronous. You know, the flow of signals through transistors is very asynchronous. Now, by putting these boundaries here and there, and say, I don't care between time t0 and time t1, whatever happens, I don't care. I only care at the end when everything is done, is said and done. By doing that, you decouple completely the functionality of the circuit from timing, OK? So that's what synchronous uh, digital logic did. And it was wonderful because then you didn't have race conditions. And race conditions are essentially the following. And depending on the data that you pump into the circuit, you may have a result or another result. And you can never tell a priori. You have to actually execute the system to figure out. And that is called a non-determinate model. So you cannot predict what it's going to do. You have actually to look at it to see what it does. Now, in synchronous, you don't have that because you don't have race conditions. Same input come in, same output comes out. Okay? So that's, uh, that's a great value for that. So um, now, in the case of, uh, of um, you know, uh, electronics, is that since you had a synchronous model behind, then you can put on top of it abstractions. You can put on top of it instruction sets. And you can put on top of it operating system, compilers, and the whole name of the game. And then you have uh, um, a potential model of what is going on as a computer program, as a single-threaded imperative program. OK. Now, so uh, you have a physical system that is described by differential equation, as we said before. And this is, in general, is determinate. Well, it's always like that. So if I give you a, a, a um, continuous equation, can we say it's determinate? Always? Or Yeah, well, besides, I mean, assume that the initial condition are given. Because that is part of the, of the system, so you have to give it. We are getting there. So the point is, if you have differential equations expressed as x dot equal to f of x, and f is Lipschitz continuous, OK. The solution exists and is unique. The behavior is determined. Now, suppose that you have uh, a mix of differential and algebraic equations. So you can have mixed with a differential equation x dot equal to something. You have also g of x equal to 0. 
Now, when you have a nonlinear equation, static equation, no derivatives around, how many solutions do you have to g of x equal to 0? Can you tell? You can have no solution. You can have a single solution. You can have multiple solutions. When you have multiple solutions, can you tell which one is right? They're all right. And so you cannot tell what the solution is. It's one of those. Right? And so you can have even in this differential equation non-deterministic behavior. Now, in all the kind of things that we do, for example, in analyzing the system and applying numerical analysis, we try to avoid this by assuming that the right hand side is continuously is, con is Lipschitz continuous. At this point, we have theorems that say you are home free. Okay, so combination, of course, are non, non determinate. So if you put in a um, sequences of instruction and you marry it with a differential equation, you don't know what's going on. Really, don't. Okay, because the abstractions are so different that there is no common ground. It's like you know, now I start speaking Swedish. I, I don't know how many people know Swedish here, but I don't presume many. And then it's a one-way conversation, right? So it's not a conversation, actually. Same thing. So one guy speaks Swedish, the other one speaks Croatian. Right? No common thing, right? All right. So the schematic of a simple CPS, when it's a physical plane, you have a computational platform, a network fabric that is the one that is used to distribute the information, and that's what you need to characterize. So computation is, in general, given in an untime imperative language. C is exactly that. So there is no time. There is no variable time. I mean, you can write equations with time in it, but the execution of C in itself the abstract execution has no notion of time. Well, of course, the physical plane has all kinds of things. So now, what do people do in order to try to... Yes, there was a question. Yeah. Yes and no, but because the model of a computer program is devoid by the notion of the clock. The clock is attached to the machine that executes the code. So the program itself doesn't have that notion. So the marriage of the two, yes, which is a problem, because when you write in C, you don't know, right? So you have to, ri to, to write C when you have deployed it into the machine, and you have to see how many instructions you go through and all of that, and you have to analyze the behavior of the platform. And then you can associate time to it. But the abstraction doesn't have the notion of time. The abstraction is the C program, per se. So now, what do people do? So they fake it, right? So that the fragment of code in there is, it's, uh, is assuming that there is a, a sort of a clock, right? It's a clock, uh, but, but it's a, a, an artifice. Every time you go through a loop, you, the timer count gets incremented by one. So that is a poor man way of talking about time. And in fact, this, uh, um, this control of timing is very approximate because you don't know what the actual clock cycle is of your computing machine. Okay, so timing behavior actually emerges from the combination of the, what I just said to you, is the marriage between the code and the actual processor. And by the way, uh, there is also a very interesting phenomena because I don't know how many of you know that, probably most of you, that in the modern architecture of computing system, you have out of order executions, right? So you, you actually execute this, uh, instructions that are supposed to come later, before, and then you hope for the best that everything is going to combine right, you know. So the, the, it's just outside the domain of time. You can do anything you want. It's an abstract domain with respect to time. So when you marry the two, then you can talk about it. So now, what have we done in the past to conquer this kind of, uh, of complexity? We already said, right? In VLSI, we did this sequential I mean, this uh, synchronous design method. So this one is a paper I wrote in 2010 about the history of EDA. What is EDA? EDA is electronic design automation. It is uh, a body of theories and computer programs uh, that attempt to help people to design systems. At the origin was electronic systems, circuits, and that the, fam the, the synchronous assumption came out of this kind of way of thinking. 
Now, it's interesting that this one uh, gave, um, a, a, as we see in the next slide, a tremendous power to increase the complexity of what we could design. Right? So they, what are, were the tricks that we used? One trick was, and we say we used because we originated in Berkeley this field. Okay? And we founded the two dominating companies, Cadence Synapses, were funded by Richard Newton and myself. So we uh, kind of know this field very well. Okay? So how did we do this? Through abstractions. So for example, synchronous as, uh, abstraction is one way. So you deal with transistors as they were just doing computation with no timing in it, and tools. You know, in general, when you want to design something quickly and accurately, you need tools. You need something that the computer is going to execute for you and give you answers. Okay? So simulation is a typical case. It is like a virtual lab. So you execute the equation and you see it. But the combination of it to actually, if I have to look back and see what it is that really made a difference, was the combination, the methodologies. Now, methodology is a way of doing things. Now, methodology are no good unless they are imperative. So what are they? Are like the Ten Commandments. Thou shall do this. Okay? So in uh, microprocessor design, you got a certain sequence of operation. Intel insists that you do that. And if someone doesn't do it, it gets fired. Okay? So in fact, methodologies, are, you can think about methodologies, freedom from choice. So it's preventing you from getting in trouble. Right? So don't do that because you are going not to be able to design. If you do this, we are going to provide you with tools, with proofs, with everything known to man. So please do that. Okay? So that's uh, an important lesson. So what were we able to do? We started again in 1971 when I graduated. They were, you know, how many, what was the largest integrated circuit that we were capable of, uh, of designing? Any idea? It was a four gate gate array. Four gates, right? Multiplied by three or four number of transistors. Twelve transistors. Twelve transistors. Now, how many transistors do you see today in the Intel chips? Taking back. Yeah, it's around one billion, right? Twelve to one billion? Okay, so I'm not Matusalem, right? So I, then, but I started with 12 transistors, end up with 1 billion transistors. So in very short time, comparatively speaking, we were able to do this. So now uh, the, uh, that is the um, uh, Moore law that says that every uh, two years the number of transistors double. And then we are going to reach the limit of what we can do is about 10 billion transistors on the chip, so we are close. And then what? And the next, who knows what it's going to be? But actually, the technology that we were able to develop here and the two companies that we founded were behind this curve. So without this, couldn't do it. No way of doing it. No way. So methodologies, abstraction, and tools. And that's what I said. I mean, this class is going to be about methodologies, abstractions, and tools for cyber-physical systems. Now, this one are, are incredibly simpler than what we are going to talk about in this class. I mean, integrated circuits are integrated circuits. Monophysics, single physics. We know the abstractions. We've done a lot of work in it, and so we know what we are doing. In the other domain, not so much. So how do we then uh, implement the methodology? There are essentially two basic principles. And one is horizontal, and one is vertical. The horizontal principle is composing and decomposing. So composing meaning that if I want to build a complex system, I take many pieces, I plug them together. So that simplifies life, right? Because I already have pieces and I plug them up. It's like Lego blocks, right? Same thing. The opposite process is decomposing. So I have a complex system, I cut it into pieces and analyze one piece at a time. So one operation is the opposite of the other. Composition, decomposition. Now, what is the vertical? The vertical is abstraction, refinement. So abstraction means I have a very complex system, a general physical system, and I want to write models that are simplified version of these things. Abstraction. Now, refinement means I have an idea, and I'm going towards implementation. So every time I do a step in the design, I add more details. Abstraction, refinement. The other one 
uh, issue is that complexity sometimes not only you do this decomposition, composition, abstraction, refinement, but you make sure that in your design methodology certain bad things can never happen. Okay? And that is synchronous design, for example, which is based on abstraction, decomposition, all that, but it's making sure no race condition. Don't have to worry about. So is um, complexity is managed by constraints. Okay, thank you. Okay. Challenges in applying this principle. So the first thing is we say composition, right? So how do you compose, right? So you, you put together things. Now, what is the problem putting together things? Well, is that if I put two Lego blocks that have different size pins, you, <laughs> they don't stick together, right? It's very difficult to make them stick together. If I have sizes that don't combine to make the house that I wanted to do, I'm going to build some kind of monster, right? So the issue that is plug and play, which is more like <laughs> plug and pray. Now, uh, and so you put together things now for this. So the name of the, of the game is that even simple things can be complicated, okay? And so you don't want to be in the plug and play, which is the same thing. Go, 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 let's open it. It doesn't work, okay? No. That's forbidden. So if you want to pass this class, if you do something like this, you are going to be dead. Okay. Now, there is another thing. Is in this, this one so is horizontal. Right? Now let's look at vertical side. Right? Vertical side is about specifying what you want to do and then doing it. Right? So uh, I love art, and I love in particular Picasso. So that's Picasso blue period. Okay? So this... Uh, Remember, Picasso was an abstract painter, but at the beginning was not abstract in the least. Look at that painting, it's wonderful. So, this is a specification. Uh, and this is the guy who's designed the uh, cyber physical system, the car that refuses to have accident, gives it to the engineers, and they come back with this. So, more or less, this is a Picasso, real Picasso, I mean, late stage Picasso. It is still a woman, but it's not exactly the same, right? There are pieces that are sticking out of all the different parts, right? And, and then you give it, the engineers give it back and say, here it is. And say, not exactly. So the uh, uh, guy who did the design looks at it and says, hmm, maybe this is what I want, okay? So it's another Picasso blue period. And so it, it, it's a very complicated process, this refinement abstraction. Because you have to have, first of all, a clear idea of what you want to do. Don't forget pieces as much as you can. And then the guys who are implementing, they have to understand what you want. And so sometimes people understand the wrong thing. Okay. So, again, the hardware of which we build computers is capable of delivering correct computation and precise team, uh, timing. And so synchronous abstraction is okay. But we have to make sure that we characterize that. Okay? And we marry the, this physical view is what your friend back there was saying. As I, after all, you know, the microprocessor has uh, the concept of latches and there is the clock. And by the way, uh, this is another thing that I tell all my students since uh, 40 years ago, that the first guy that tells me that the synchronous design is based on clocks, you're fired. You know, just change universe. Go to MIT. Because they will always tell you that. And it's wrong, because that is a way of implementing synchrony, okay, using the clock. But in the abstract, no, it's a different thing, okay? So uh, let's make sure that you understand what is the specification and what is the implementation, okay? So you have to think critically, all right? So can we change the way in which to do, for example, embed the software so that we can put timing inside the uh, operation of the software, and we can put power and other physical conditions. So that's uh, a, an interesting goal that we are setting for, a, um, for ourselves, and we need determinate CPS. Determinate means that I don't want to say, oh, let's hope for the best. I want to know, and so I have to have determinate models. Otherwise, I will not going to be able to do it. So how can we overcome the powerful inertia of people are using writing in C or C++ or whatever, an embedded system written in C and C++, bad news, guys. They can be implemented, maybe even automatically, but the meaning of that program has to come from a higher level abstraction. Then the implementation takes that form, very same way in which microprocessor 
as a synchronous assumption, but you implement it with transistors, which are asynchronous component. Okay. Now, we need open minds, so we need to try to break out of the old ways of doing things. Now, the challenge of CPS system is that, in general, and in any company I visited and I did consulting work for and all of that, is always this case. There are gazillion people, the guy who's dying, doing the hardware, the guy who's doing the software, they never talk to each other, they put things together and never work. Right? So, bad news. Why? Because it, there is not a single person who has a global view. That is called the chief architect. You know, sometimes you do, but it's very rare. So chief architects don't abound. And so everybody goes about putting together the system by pre plugging and praying, right, the various components. All right. So this one is actually a very interesting system that you may find yourself dealing with in uh, one of the projects, which is an electrical power distribution system. So in all your uh, airplanes, you have such a system, which is a set of generators that deliver electricity to your loads. Your entertainment system is fed by this. Air conditioning system is fed by this. The, the movement of the alerons and uh, the braking of the uh, wheels come from the generator system. The main engine is thrusting the thing on, but there are secondary generators that uh, do this. Now, it's very interesting because if you lose power on the sky, you lose the plane. So boom, right? Don't want that to happen, right? So what you want to do is you want to assess properties of this system, and you have to make sure that it is fault resistant. So how do you make it fault resistant? You duplicate things, and you put switches in such a way that the critical loads are always served, or you know, one probability over a million. Um, may something bad may happen, but you don't want that to happen. So that is a design challenge, very interesting one. And so if you look at what the components here are, there is a generator, a conductor, a bus, a load that uh, are considered disturbances to the power distribution systems. And, and then you have the intelligence, the controllers that open and close the contacts and all of that. So the generator is an electromechanical system. The conductor is a mechanical is a big gigantic switch, right? Because you have to, to, to make uh, hundreds of amperes going back. The bus is an electrical system. Uh, the PID is a controller, so it's a control system, a Zapster control system. A supervisor of finite state machine is a software system. Uh, you have the communication between the switch and the supervisory control, which is a communication network. And then you have a switch which is actually commanded by some human operator. So you have main machine interface. That is complicated, okay? Now, the theme of this course is think critically. Any course that tell you that how to design this thing is going to last two years, and then you are out of the job, right? It ain't going to work. The technology will change. So what we try to do is to give you the foundation so that you can deal with changes in technology. OK, so which I said just at the very beginning of this class. So keep this in mind. Now, say this, we go to the uh, boring part of the stuff that is uh, what we are going to do to you uh, in terms of, uh, <laughs> aha, I got you immediately interested. OK, in terms of how we are going to, um, to evaluate the class. OK, so the book is uh, Lee and Sasha. Uh, and by the way, there is a new version. It's 1.5. It's not publicly available as yet, but you have it. In your B course uh, domain, you go down. You can download it and print it if you want to. Now, the organization, as I said before, is about modeling, is about design, and is about analysis. And there are the three mainstay of the class right there. Now, this is a list of the lectures and who is going to teach it. Now, this one is subject to change, right? This uh, is a classical uh, uh, disclaimer. So this is what we intend to do, but someone may get sick, someone may be called someplace, so, but this is the idea. That's what we would like to do. You are going to get homework to do, and the first homework is due on 9-11. Sorry for the day, but you know, that's it. And uh, the homework number one is about the topic that are covered in uh, the next week. OK. Now, uh, this is a guy who has helped setting up the labs. The first six weeks of the lab is Jeff Jensen, who was a student here. 
now is uh, at National Instruments. So you will see that the tools that we use in the labs are provided by this company is giving us for free. So thank you, National Instrument. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's also paying for the lab. Thank you, National Instrument. <laughs> And we have also some of the National Instruments people who are going to, uh, to, to help in some of the projects. Thank you, National Instruments. Uh, <laughs> and we have here the, uh, our friend uh, Forever, <laughs> who is the director of the National Instruments Lab in Berkeley. Thank you, National Instruments, <laughs> for giving us a lab in uh, beautiful Berkeley. <laughs> okay. So uh, now this one is a manual of the lab, an interrelatory lab and embedded cyber physical system. And by the way, all the EDS stuff that I talked to you about, we have to say thanks to all the companies in the world, right? Because everybody supported our work. In addition to DARPA and SF, usual stuff. But without the companies supporting these things, when you do design work, you always want to have companies involved because otherwise you solve problems that may not be relevant. Course project, aha! Uh -huh. Now, course project in the past, we let the students come up with proposals. So, uh, for example, you would come to me and say, oh, I would like to build you know, a wonderful quadro rotor that does this, this, and that. And say, gee, nice idea. So go and do it, and uh, that's it. Now, this works when you have 20 students. When you have 120 students, ain't going to work. So this is, uh, forget it. So we will give you projects, and we like very much you to pick one of these. Now, in case some of you is uh, the next um, Bill Gates or, uh, or uh, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, you know, we will entertain the motion, especially if you give us a few stock uh, of your new company. But the, the key point is that uh, it's very difficult to evaluate then what you do, right? So, so please stick as much as possible to this. We um, encourage you to form, actually, we will tell you to form groups of four people and then, uh, given the number, there will be multiple teams working on the same project in competition. Yes. And then at the end of the class, we'll see who wins that competition. Okay. So if you want to see some of the project, you can look at of the past. You can look at the course website. These are some of the things. You know, autonomous flight. Now, a, a word of caveats. In the past, it was a disaster. Right? Everybody who wanted to do something like that, they had crashes, I mean, you know, hundreds of dollars thrown down the drain because the thing would bump everywhere. So in any case, but you are free to try if you want to. Um, and in fact, this is another interesting project is uh, uh, using a Lego Mindstorm and, you know, it, it's doing essentially segway. So it's balancing on two wheels. That was a very interesting project, very complicated. But I have an idea. I would like you to do this. No, oops. How do you make this video 